Um, so the program is uh, there are f uh, basically four blocks. Uh, the first block you uh, you don't have to really have a R Studio running. It's a everybody can hear you back. Otherwise, we can have the phone. Is it okay from the back line? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I will try to talk a bit louder. I'm a loud speaking person, and my wife is aware of that also. Um, so uh, so we'll have four blocks. Uh, first block is a bit of introduction overview. Um, and then uh, the second block, we'll start doing some uh, exercises, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, reproduce some of the things on your laptop. And then there is a little space to, for you to explore and to uh, test out things your way. Um, and then we have a lunch break, and then Gerald will have a block. Uh, very happy to have uh, Gerard Hoeveling, the professor from Wagen University. We are, by the way, both from Wagen and campus, just from different parts of the campus. Um, and so very happy to have Herod with us, and he'll, uh, he will open a bit of uh, floor for discussion also about uh, how to do cross-validation with spatial data and um, how do you estimate prediction errors and what's the, what are the possible approaches. And so it's, it's, I would like to see more like a, a floor for debate. And then I will show you the, one more time this ensemble method for a predictive soil mapping. That's something that I'm learning at the moment, uh, doing at the moment. Um, so, so that's kind of the idea. Uh, so the objectives. Uh, so uh, maybe I don't know how many of you are. Uh, uh, we have this paper in PRJ, um, and so how many of you um, have been looking at using distances with machine learning? Can you raise your hand? Okay. So that this is very good. So I see only three hands. So that's that's. So there will be lots of new things that you will see. Um, also, how many of you are kind of a GitHub culture? I call myself GitHub culture because now I'm stuck with it. How many of you are daily on GitHub committing and doing things? Please raise your hand. I need to see. Okay, see only one hand. Oh, that's also very good. So you will see a bit of GitHub culture. Um, how many of you did spatial cross-validation before? Spatial cross-validation. Have you heard of it? Okay, bit more hands, bit more hands. And ensemble machine learning? Ensemble machine learning? Yes? Okay, six, seven. Now, this is all very good, so I think this, uh, we, are, we, are, we are a good match because I, I have lots of things for you, and, and it's good that you, you uh, if you are novel to this and if you haven't tested also, if you have used it, this, I'm going to do ensemble machine learning on spatial data, so it's a bit different. Um, so, a disclaimer. Uh, so, for those of you who are just starting, um, it's difficult to learn something very advanced in one day. So, don't don't expect it's going to happen. I mean, there is there are maybe some techniques that for people to learn things in one day, uh, but otherwise, it's it's difficult. Um, also, machine learning is not it's not something many people think, oh, yeah, I can skip now. Machine learning is, you know, you just, you don't have to think about models so much, and, and you just say, this is my data, find patterns, whatever. And so many people think I can skip now all the other things, but it's not true. It's machine learning, just a, a more advanced statistics combined with computer science. That's what machine learning is. So actually, you have to become better in statistics. Um, and also then, all the principles that, like when we do regression problems, all the principles in statistics you have in regression, you, they apply also uh, in machine learning. So it's not that you can forget them. Uh, so this is just a bit of disclaimer. Uh, okay, the many things I'll, I'll be talking about, it is in the book. Um, and this is a book, so I can show you that. It's a, a book is available, so it's available online. I think some of you have maybe used it. Um, Anything in the book has a URL, unique URL. So if you go to some chapter, um, and you can say, well, I'm interested in this section, then you see every every chapter has a unique URL. The, uh, the, the, the domain, the home page of book is soulmapper.org. And so if you have a question you want to ask me, you can just take that URL and send it. I'm testing this, and I'm getting these problems. Uh, so, so the book is, as you see, it's a... Uh, it's online and you can download it as a PDF, uh, but you can also buy a printed copy. Um, if you buy the printed copy, there's, 
because the the content I'm very happy that the book is registered as an open it's an open uh, um, content book so it's registered under Creative Commons license there are some books in uh, so to do something in R but they're they're accessible you can see them but it's not a free content it's not open content okay so I'm very happy I, we managed to register the book so it's a Creative Commons license so you can also just use and you know any figure or anything you can use. The only condition is that you reference soulmapper.org and and that if you make some derivative work out of it that it has to be also open. These are only two conditions and that's it. Uh, so I'm very happy. I want to show this book. Uh, this book was a lot of work. So I want to show how this book looks like um, the, the back end. So here's the book. Uh, this is the, the, can you recognize what is this? So this is called R Bookdown. So R Bookdown is a, it's a package, it's a software solution that wraps up uh, Markdown, R, um, Pandoc, and Tech. So four languages and puts it all together. And it's uh, the, the most professional way to write scientific content. I, Cannot find more professional way at the moment. Maybe there's something will pop up, but just to show you, so you you specify some parameters of the book. You can specify the styling. This is the styling of the book. You can specify the uh, font size. You can decrease. Uh, then you have bibliography, which is a bib text, uh, and then you write a chapter. So so this will be a chapter, and you see this is markdown, and then you have in markdown you have eventually some code. Uh, maybe not this one. Let me see. So there will be some codes. Yes, like this one. And so this code will run. So you can run it from our studio. I can run and keep on testing. So I keep on writing the text and I write the code at the same time. And then once I'm done, I go to to the index file. Index file has all the settings. This one here, and then I say knit it, and then it, it does this. It takes the whole whole chapters and compiles everything. And this looks very easy, right? It just poof. So it took me about three weeks to compile everything because it it has this one single problem with the font or with some missing library. Yeah? It's not going to work because it's it's four four programming platforms: Pandoc, uh, Tech, Markdown, and R. And so if I make a little mistake in any of the code, it, the book is not going to come up. And you see it takes about 10 seconds to compile the book. Um, but the point is what's important that, that everything you see in this code, uh, so it's a, a proof that uh, if it compiles, it's reproducible. It compiles. And it means you should, be, you should get the same uh, output as me if you, if you clone that. If you go to, to GitHub and if you clone that, uh, so here's the book. It's open so you can see it and you can see how it's been written. And if you now uh, clone it or if you make a, a fork, uh, then you should be able to uh, compile. As long as you have all the packages, but all the packages are open source, so it, there shouldn't be a problem. But it takes a bit of time. So uh, it was a lot of work, and I couldn't figure it out myself. So luckily, I know the people in the RStat community, uh, and they helped me, especially Jakob, uh, Jakob Novosad. He helped me. He knew some tricks, and also um, um, the people who made the geocomputation with our book, they also helped me. Uh, so I'm, I was in the end happy, um, and I see it now. If I want to write a content, I, I will write. I want to write like this. It's the most professional way to go. So, uh, so this is a bit about the book. Uh, I'm looking. At also, nice thing about doing an open book, you know, when you go with a publisher, uh, the copyright is on publisher and. Um, it's decision on them whether they want revisions. They usually don't like that you revise. If you want to revise, then you have to pay extra. Um, but when you make open book, I can revise now. I can fix and I upload. 
and it will be and then I just have to put it on Lulu and then it's a new version so you when you print it you have the error suffix uh, and also we want to keep on extending we want to add chapters so I did ask on Twitter uh, what are people interested in and this is what we got so far uh, so uh, some people are for soil sampling lots of people soil sampling tutorial so that's a will be a nice chapter and then soil carbon sequestration uh, how do you do that in R? How do you compute it? Um, and it's a bit different than Facebook. Um, so you see the soil sampling is now second, but soil spectroscopy is first. Um, this one got a bit more votes, I think. I don't see now, but it's a bit more votes. So which one do I, which one is more serious, Twitter or Facebook? I have to do ensemble here, right? So I need to do ensemble. I have to take the number of votes. Uh, per, per block and then how serious is Facebook and how serious is Twitter and then calculate the, the mean average. That's the first ensemble I have to do. But looks like it's the sampling, soil sampling and this uh, soil spectroscopy data. Now it's a question, which one is second? Uh, if, you, if you want to contribute a chapter, it's also possible. We have some minimum requirements. Of course, it has to be on soil data. Uh, and it has to be reproducible. It has to have open data as examples. So there are some minimum requirements, but otherwise, if you want, if you contribute chapter, you can, you become also a co-editor. Uh, the first person on the chapter is the co-editor. So that's also possible. The other thing I was working on is the land map package. This one is not in this book. So land map is not in the book. This is something I started working one or two months ago. Uh, have you tested it? Have you maybe looked at it? So what I discovered, I discovered that there were some problems if I if I run it on the um, uh, Windows. By the way, the land map package, it's supposed to have different functionality, but the main focus is to do uh, to produ do production of data on uh, land variables, environmental variables, etc. And one of them is of course soil soil variables. And so one of the functionalities to do automated mapping. And, uh, and so here's the example I would load the package. So I, like in the book, you can see I do some ensemble uh, methods. I explain, you know, how you step by step build up ensemble. And then in this package, I now don't go and explain it anymore. It's just I make a function. And this function is called train SP learner. SP is for spatial. So uh, build a model using spatial data. Uh, what do you need for that? Well, you need the training points. So this is a object of a class spatial points data frame. And you need the, the grids. And the grids contain the covariates. And then here are some parameters. If you have a variable which is log normal, then you need the lambda 1. And also uh, what I discovered when I do it, when I do it under Windows, I'm very sorry I develop stuff now exclusively on, on, on Unix systems. So now I realize if I do some things under Windows, I will get some problems. So I have to do some debugging. I have to get a Windows machine. So I see I get some problem with the GOR package. So I'll have to work on that. Um, and, but then I, if I turn off the variable modeling, so here if I turn it off, uh, then it goes through. It does take a bit of time, right? This is a li this little data set from um, from the GSTAR package. It's a classical data set. It's so famous data set that one day we decided to take a bicycle and cycle to the pilgrimage place, to this uh, mass uh, area. So we cycled there, we took pictures and, you know, pilgrimage place. So you see, when I run it on the uh, Windows machine, it's a bit slower because I think some parallelization doesn't come out of box. It's not very, it's not very uh, optimized. So I show you the same thing on the uh, Linux system. Now let's go here. So here's the same example. Uh. There'll be different messages also under Windows. Or the packages. So here's the example, and I run it now. Oops. I forgot my own package.
so you can maybe compare you remember it took it took about uh maybe even uh forty seconds to compute the model and now when I run it in Linux, you see it was done in three seconds, so about six times faster. Why is it six times faster because i have this is a nice laptop I have eight cores eight eight threads. And it, it, the, I have made, I make the same code under Linux and, and same code under Windows. And out, under Linux, it out of box, it is parallelized. Okay, so it computes, uses all the resource to compute. And under Windows, it, I need to do tweaks to get it parallelized. I need to change the code. Uh, so one more time. So this is, so what I'm doing, you can see the output. I, I print out the text. Uh, so I take this. Uh, grids and I calculate principal components, then I calculate buffer distances to points, then I combine that all in a, a one stack, then I do an overlay, and I also calculate ID uh, based on the, so I will take a variogram, I fit a variogram, and I calculate what is the effective range of spatial dependence, and then I calculate the size of the blocks. And then based on that size of blocks, I put each point I put in a different cluster, in different blocks. So when I do any cross validation, I don't mix the points from the same block. That's called spatial or block cross validation. And then I finally fit the model using the subsample package. And this one takes a tree. I take three learners, which are kind of very common. I take the random forest support vector machines and XGBoost. So I take three learners because I don't need like 20. Uh, and I know these ones are quite effective. And then I compute uh, ensemble based on these three liners. And it's all at once. And then when I do predictions, this is fast and you get this thing. So here's a, here's a map of the, this is a lead, lead concentration. Okay, so I'll explain you later on, but it looks pretty much like universal Kriging. So it has the spatial dependence structure, but it's based on a, machine learning, ensemble machine learning. And then the next thing, because there are multiple learners, you can also get the variance for each pixel. And so you can see that this place here and this place here, they have the highest variance. So, so models have most problems. And these are models are based on cross validation also. So they have a, they always, I set up a, a three fold or five fold. So they always take like, you know, 80% um, of data for training, 20% for validation. But for each run, it's a different subset. Um, and then uh, you can then see what is also the, what are the problems of that ensemble model. And it's not one-to-one -one with the uncertainty. I still have to figure out how to do actual prediction error that you can say this is my 90% probability interval. I have to figure that out. Uh, but, but it's getting in that direction, so. So this is the uh, land map package. This is what I really want to show you. This is like the most advanced thing. Um, and I will show you with the examples that you can use it for uh, numeric data, for log normal data, for binomial data, and for classification problems. So it's a very, very generic. And on the end, it will be the function will be literally just, these are my points, these are my grids, make, make magic. That's what I want to do. Why do I want to do that? I want to, um, I want to fire myself from doing predictive soil mapping. I want to make myself redundant so I can do something else. No, we do it also because we want to, you know, we want to uh, get the best. Primarily, it's about, it's about accuracy. It's about automation. It's about robustness. It's about getting also a good accuracy of the uncertainty. Uh, so that, that's really why I do it. Not because I want to fire myself. I want to get more work for myself. Uh, this is my uh, evolution, uh, my history. I started in 1999. I was very excited about geostatistics. I saw my first Krieging lessons and I thought this is amazing. You know, you, you have these samples and you generate maps and, uh, you know, you, you, you have a complex, complex models and I like complexity. And so that was in uh, uh, 1999, yes. And then I started looking at regression Krieging. I saw, okay, you can do Krieging, that's if you just have the points. But what about you have remote sensing data, you have a DM data. 
Then I started doing this regression clearing. That was my main PhD thesis topic. And I also influenced by Gerard Kuvelink at that time. I met him for the first time. Um, he uh, offered me to have a meeting. Um, he was in Amsterdam, I was in Enschede, which is about three hours. Um, and so she said, yeah, come, I, I, I'm, I'm available next week at 12. So I came from Enschede for three hours and I sit in his office and uh, I explain him the problem. And he says, okay, your time is up. And he says, you have to go, I have to go teaching. And I, because I didn't check whether we, it looks like we can only talk for one hour. I think that was a standard in Netherlands. If you say we have a meeting, it's one hour meeting. And uh, so then I went back. So I spent six hours in a train uh, to talk with him for one hour just to explain half of the problem. But we continued after that and, and uh, it was a good match. I think I, I'm excited about mapping and GIS and Herod is a very good statistician. He has a mathematical applied mathematics background. So we were a very good match. So he derived some formulas. And so he could prove it mathematically and I prove with the data. And that's the most beautiful science when you prove it from two directions and you do this triangulation, you come to the same thing, you know. The, the engineering is when people build uh, a tunnel from La Manche tunnel and the, you know, the French side and the English side, they come to the same point. You know, that's the engineering. And in science, it's also like this. You need to triangulate to get to the same thing. And then you feel like, okay, I think we understand what's going on now. Um, then in 2014, I started testing random forest. I saw these linear models are fine, but what about this random forest? I heard about it and I see people are using it. And, and then we started doing for Africa. We did uh, Africa soil properties and we used random forest. And then next, next thing was, okay, it's not enough for me. I go further. I want more methods. And then I started combining random forest XGBoost with Pertractor machines. I saw like XGBoost, I started following other people in RSTAT and I started looking what are the methods they use. And most importantly, um, I followed the Kaggle, Kaggle.com, which has competition with the real data. So they give a data and say, uh, these are the training points and, and tell us what is with the result here. And so these are these uh, hackathons or uh, uh, datatons, I don't know. And, and I saw that many cases there was XGBoost, the software, open source software was winning. Today it's TensorFlow or some deep uh, neural nets, I don't know. But at that time it was XGBoost, so I started using XGBoost. And then uh, two years ago, something like two, two, three years ago, I started looking, okay, this random forest, it's, you know, how do you use it on spatial data? I think we ignore spatial dependence. We ignore, you know, variograms and things. And then we started thinking, well, how do we do that? And I came to this idea just to incorporate buffer distances and maybe even more complex distances. And then we published this paper. And then the next phase after that was ensemble, uh, ensemble machine learning for spatial data. And what I would like to do is a global spatial temporal ensemble machine learning. That's what I w would like to do. That's if you ask me, if we if we have problems in the world, we have to monitor soil carbon, we have to monitor soil erosion, da, da, da. I would like to build. I think the solution is ensemble machine learning space time, and so so that's kind of my evolution of uh, spatial analysis and geostatistics. Uh, this is just to show you. I was excited, so going from ordinary Kriging to regression Kriging. So these pixels are masked because the error error of these pixels is higher than the variance in the data. So I mask them. It's like it's, when you make a prediction which is as good as a, a, a randomly drawing from distribution, then you don't make a map. So I tend to mask out these pixels. And you see when you do regression creating, you add some covariates and then you can map this on same content a bit more accurate. And then you see all the pixels are complete. And so I was excited about that. And then who influenced me also a bit is Marcus Walsh from the AFSIS project because he was just at that time, it's already 2015, I think he was saying, oh yeah, you should do ensemble machine learning. And I was thinking it's very computational machine learning. It is one of the main problems of machine learning as you will see. And as you saw, I just run it here. It's very computational. I mean, I take 155 points and I have two covariates which have 3000 pixels each. And it will run for, uh, you know, 40 seconds. It's very computation. I think, why is it, why does it take so much time? Um, oops.
Yes. Uh, password, password, what's the password? The lessons are finished. It has automatic, uh, yes. Uh, I have the project uh, projection. Okay. Okay, it's all good. It's all good. It's, you explained me. It was my mistake. You explained me yesterday. Okay, so I, I got interested more and more, and I see that this thing that I got really interested in is data science. So it's a bit different from, like, all my education, master degree, PhD degree. I was always working with statistical models, assumptions, you know. Um, the, the beauty of models is that they are, like, if you take a Gaussian distribution, right? You have Gaussian distribution, you have two parameters. You have mean and, and standard deviation. And with these two standard deviation, you explain this distribution of something. It's really powerful, this compression of knowledge. It's very powerful. And that's the beauty for many, you know, people in physics, mathematics. The beauty is having uh, something complex, uh, like compressed into, like, few parameters. Uh, but then in data science, the beauty is in what? What's the beauty in data science? Uh, no. The complexity is in both, in both the model-based statistics and in data science. So the, in data, there's two things. It's the, the, the beauty is in having the best quality data, and you focus everything on data. Okay? And then the second thing is that you do more advanced computing. So you do, and the highest level computing is computing where you build knowledge. And that's what they call training or learning, okay? So there are these two things are beautiful in data science, the data and the, the, the learning from data. That's what makes the data science. So it's not about, hey, make a model which is very small, you know, that is two parameters. You finish making hyperparametric models. I finish, when I fit now machine learning, ensemble machine learning, I make objects which are bigger than the, the input data. Because they're hyperparametric, there will be a few gigabytes. Okay? It doesn't matter. It's not, I mean, it's for somebody who wants like something simplified. It's oh, horrible. But I said, no, it's, I like it because I want that it matches data good and that I can learn from it. And that's the beauty of uh, data science. Uh, this is a classical illustration of what's important if you want to become data scientist. So you see, you still have to do statistics and math, but you have to learn all these machine learning methods, you have to learn good computer science, you have to learn how to code, um, and you have to learn the databases, or um, uh, mainly back-end back uh, aspects of data analysis. So this is a modern data scientist. Um, also, you see here, I'm now, I'm now really here. I'm, my professional work is really, I'm somewhere here maybe a bit more data data analyst, but I also had to learn to do software engineering. I had to learn how to make a package, how to compile, how to automate, uh, and then also how to visualize. If you don't visualize it, it also doesn't have an effect. Um, machine learning, I'm not going to teach today machine learning. I think that's not, I don't know if you expected that we will go session by session. This is random forest, this is super vector machines, this is this. We're not going to do that. But nevertheless, it's not, you know, it's not too complicated also. I see it, there, are, uh, there are differences between methods, but in principle, it boils down to supervised, unsupervised, regression, classification, and then clustering and dimension reduction and things. So these are like generic, generic cases. You will see when you work with, the, for example, Ranger package, which is a scalable uh, random forest, it can be used for um, uh, regression problems, classification problems, and for survival problems. So, so it's, there are these generic techniques now in machine learning, they, they're applicable to many, many types of statistical problems. And I, I wasn't aware, like when I started using a random forest, I was thinking it's only for regression problems, but no, it's equally applicable to classification problems. And it also performs very well. 
Um, some of the books that I started reading 2014, 2015, especially because of the carrot package. Anybody uses carrot package? Yes, many people know it. So it's a very uh, comprehensive package. I think it's really, really well done because you start understanding what does it mean, fine tuning model, what does it mean? It's kind of um, a modeling engineering. You know, you have to think about efficiency criteria. You have to think about the uh, comparing models, model comparison. And so that was all carrot package. And it was a wrapper, so you could do like in few lines of codes. It was really, for me, magic when I saw carrot package first time. I would just say, hey, these are my models, you know, things that I would do a few years before for, to write a paper, I would have to like do all the models myself and, uh, and figure out how I'm going to compare. You carrot package, you go in two, three lines, and you say, hey, here's my data, here's the models, Wow, oh, tell me which is the best, right? So Carrot was very powerful. Um, there's also this book I share with you, Irizari. Uh, he has also a nice book on overview of machine learning. So if you're interested in learning about machine learning, uh, go for this book. I did send you that link. Uh, and it is also, uh, of course, our book down. I will never send you a book which is not our book down, right? Um, so it, it is a fantastic book, and so you take a look, and this one step-by-step -step explanation, what is Render Forest, for example. Also with the code, theoretically, and with the code. Um, in, the mean, in the meanwhile, the machine learning is getting better and better, and we get surprised. I don't know if you follow the news. So there was this GoGo game, and the Google team uh, won four to one. Uh, there's an excellent documentary about the whole competition. I highly recommend watching. It's one of the best documentaries I saw in my life. Um, and so they show how, uh, on the beginning, they interviewed this world champion, uh, real guru of the game, uh, which is a complex game. And he thought that he's going to win 5-0. There is no way. I mean, you know, you have to be very creative to do a go-go game. And number of combination is so high that you cannot compute them with, if, if you use all the computing resources in the world. But he won 4-1. And uh, there's this ma one game that he won. He made one move, which they call a, a God's move, because it was never, uh, this strategy that he used was never ever implemented. So, and that's the only way he could beat the machine. But now they say most likely it's already behind. Nobody can beat GoGo game. You cannot beat in chess, GoGo game. Also, even this, uh, this, uh, 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 let me see, uh, uh, StarCraft. Even more, have you read about this? This is like thousand times more complex than GoGo game. And also their machines, they, uh, they beat at humans. So uh, things are moving actually maybe even faster than we thought, um, which is, there's some good news about it. There's some bad news. As you heard, probably the bad news is that, yes, there will be many jobs become redundant. And uh, so there might be another French Revolution. I find it, you know, if you if you think like that, that you see only negative side, right? It's it's not a good way. Um, uh, so I see it ma mainly as a positive development, you know, that we have more and more efficient machine learning, and we can automate lots of processes. We can make redundant some jobs which are not very intellectual and not creative. Anything which is not creative, you know, we should discourage. I mean, unless you do it for hobby. But people shouldn't be working, transporting something or cleaning something, you know. They shouldn't be doing that. They should be doing creative uh, works. Um, okay, so machine learning, very interesting, random forest. But what happens, it ignores, it ignores spatial uh, autocorrelation. You just don't, you, like, I can find you many papers uh, published uh, random forest for predictive soil mapping, and they don't consider anything about spatial location of points, zero. Okay, they just take the points, overlay, and then run machine learning and make a map. And I bet you, you in the room here, you also publish papers like that, right? You just take the points, you overlay, and you don't care whether all the points are, you know, inside the cluster of a few kilometers or if they're spread around, you know, you don't care, right? You just take and you get some R squared 0.8, and that's the most important, right? And then you say, here's the map. And also very important, you say, hey, I'm using machine learning. It's a hot topic. You know, these buzzwords today, like, you know, if you make a, some product with a buzzword, it will sell itself. People don't even, you know, analyze it. Well, what's really special about it? And I think with machine learning, it's a bit like that. 
And so I was, I started thinking, okay, that's not good. That's not good. So we, we wrote this paper. Uh, it's in PJ. And then uh, we looked at, okay, how do we incorporate? And I went like, okay, I'm just, I will think about many ways how you could do that. Um, and then also discuss with Madeleine and, and Marvin and Herat and uh, Ben. So we discuss these things and, and we look at what's the di different ways you could do. But the first fundamental way was to uh, just compute the buffer distances. So you just compute the buffer distances from uh, one point to all the points. It's uh, nothing really scary, uh, so I can show you that. So let's take a look. In this model I fitted, they are already, um, they are already, I think, buffer distances here. Uh, Oh, okay, it was already here. So, so I already computed uh, buffer distances, and so basically you have a single point, and it just calculates distance to the rest of the area. Okay, nothing special. Um, and then once you calculate this buffer distance, you make an overlay, and then you fit a random forest model. And then the formula, it's a bit long formula because I say, um, so zinc, is a function of 155 buffer distances, the 155 points. And I say uh, zinc is a function of 155 buffer distance. So I have a, a 155 training points and 155 covariate. It's over, over, uh, over parameterized. But for, for machine learning, it's not a problem. And then I do predictions, and then I get this thing. And so, and this is, State of the art geostatistics, GOR. Who's using GR, by the way? GR, yes, two. So it's a state of the art geostatistics. It's model based geostatistics. It's an excellent book. And it, the package is like, uh, works very good with the log normal variables uh, and also the vario modeling and um, uh, trend modeling. It's incorporated. So very elegant. It's a, made in Brazil a bit. So Brazil should be proud of that. So very good package, and, and this is state of the art. And you have to specify, you have to fit the variegam first, you have to specify distribution, you have to specify initial parameters. So there's lots of work. That's where the geostatisticians come. You know, they have to make the choices. That's the difference between data science and model-based statistics. You know, you have to make choices about the model, right? And then you get this thing. And this is me not making any choices, zero. I just say random forest. And so what happens when you analyze the variegam of this, it's a similar variegam. So the, the spatial dependence is integrated. So it becomes integrated. Somehow machine learning finds out the spatial continuity because it has the distances. And because it's a nonlinear, it constructs predictions as a nonlinear combination of distances between points. And you get the same thing when you fit the variegam. It's a kind of exponential model or something. You get the, the same thing, nonlinearity is kind of represented. Okay, and then I repeated, I took different data sets. Let's try different data sets. And uh, again, GOR, uh, this is model-based geostatistics, initial variogram. I have some, uh, um, um, so these are also from Netherlands points. And this is the random forest. You see, there is some smoothing happening. There is some smoothing. So the, it definitely is a bit different picture. Uh, so, but there's a smoothing happening, and I was thinking most likely because render forest is an ensemble, ensemble of you know you put like 500 trees, and then some of the points they get uh, taken out, and so because they're taken out, it slowly smooths out, it smooths out the values. Once I move to the bigger data, this is a Switzerland, this is a so-called uh, SIC uh, 1997, SIC 97 spatial interpolation comparison data set they use. They will, uh, they will make a data set, then they send it to like 20 groups, and they said make the best predictions, and then they collect all the predictions, and they say these are the winners. It's called spatial interpolation comparison. They stopped running these games, but it was very interesting at that time. That's 1997, 2001, 2004. Um, and so that was a data set. And, and again, you do, uh, now you do universal keying, also in GOR. So you have a covariates, 
Uh, and you have an isotropy. You have to model an isotropy, right? It's very anisotropic. And again, when you do random forest, so you don't have to specify anything, but you get anisotropy com comes up. So it comes up, it picks up the anisotropy. Um, it, it's uh, also here you see like it's a global model. So once you specify an isotropy, it looks the same all around. But here, when you do random forest, because it's a tree-based model, it can locally show an isotropy or it can be isotropic. So it can have both things depending on the locally on the data. It tries to adjust as much as possible to the data. Uh, then this is the universal Krieging prediction error. I was always suspicious about it, you know. I was a bit suspicious. I was thinking that uh, because of these um, uh, assumptions in geostatistics of, of global parameters and things, I was a bit suspicious that it doesn't really show where the problems. When you do random forest, it will pick up local areas where you have problems. So, so many people say, well, you know, why is this map so different? It's, well, because it's made on more trial and error and points are taken in and out, and eventually it finds that some points are like continuously having problems. And, and then it will uh, locally de detect these uh, errors. So we wrote this uh, tutorial. So we, we made a paper in uh, PJ. I highly recommend anybody publishes in PJ. PJ, have you ever heard of it? Yes? I think it's the, when I noticed how they work, I said, thank God, finally a journal. Because it's very intelligent. It's a, it's a, um, a company that understands what is really the key. Uh, so they have a very fast turnout. Uh, and also they understand that you cannot go in and charge people $2,000 for open access. You know, this is overblown price. It's because of the monopoly. So do you know how much they charge for open access? Do you know? It's $400 per person, per author. $400 lifelong. Lifelong. So you pay it once and you focus on science. And that's it. And I think this is about 10 times less than what the others charge. About 10 times less, not 30% or 10%. 10 times less. And I think that's the right way to go. They also award reviewers, and reviews are published, so it's a trans transparent process. It's only open access. Uh, and they integrate all the social networks, and you can comment on papers immediately. You don't have to write to blah, blah, blah. You go, you post, you log in, and you post. If you say, I have a problem, I don't understand it, you post it. It's the right way to do so. So I switch, actually, I publish only really in PJ. It's a mega journal, so all the topics are covered. Uh, and I like it a lot because they have a, everything is documented, so review process is documented, and you can put embed the code in the document, etc. But once we made the PJ paper, we also made this tutorial. And this is the thing I send you. So that's the stuff we're going to do in the second block after the coffee break. Um, and specifically, we will do this thing about the uncertainty. So we will do that for about one and a half hour. I will go through all these things and explain you. And then we'll have a lunch break. And then Herod is going to uh, zoom in a bit and, and look at specific things inside this code. Um, this thing, I, I, I don't have a stick for you or anything, but you have to just grab it from GitHub. And usually, I will show you that in the second block. So you will just download a zip file. And then you extract it, and you can run the code, and then you can modify, you can try your own things. Um, the one, the, those of you who are GitHub culture, you can also clone it, or you can fork it, and then you can change, and you can give me uh, uh, comments or suggestions, and then I will merge them, and they will be visible in the tutorial. This is called GitHub culture. I had some people fixing things for me, just because they think it's important. And then they will say, hey, I fix this. And then I just do a, a pull request. Uh, they do a pull request and I do a merge. And, uh, and then you can see who did the code. So it's a developing code in network. Uh, we did only buffer distances. This is, this is the buffer distances, right? If you have a point and you have a buffer distance, very, very primitive, and assumes that the space is like flat, more or less. But you can also, uh, in, in R, uh, there's a package, it's a nice package called G-Distance. So you can, you can plug in a topography, and it, it uh, calculates this uh, complex distance. So this is distance assuming complexity of terrain in every direction. So you can plug in also more complex distances, 
And also Saga GS is very efficient, also C++ GS, one of the best GS in the world. Um, and you can also compute a so-called uh, uh, up slope and down slope distances. So this map shows distance from this point to all the points, but only in the watershed. Okay, only in the watershed. And you can calculate it up slope and down slope. And so you could calculate also these complex distances, and then you pull them again in the machine learning, and then you do uh, again learning. This thing I'm not doing yet, because it's a bit more computational. This G distance is very computational, but I think it's going to come soon. And I wanted to do that in just this is a long time, because I knew that if you have like a bridge, uh, sorry, a ridge, yes, and you have a watershed, and if you have two points which are on the other side of the hill, they're in Euclidean space, they're close together, but they're actually hydrologically disconnected. And you ignore that and you incorporate that in the model blindly. Okay, so if you could find a way to incorporate that intelligently, so you say, well, I know this is a watershed. If, if some nutrients, they will drain down the hill. So if there's a spill or something, it will drain down the hill. It's not going to drain this way. Yeah, so this point is actually for this watershed, it's further away than this point. And so, so you can incorporate this uh, more intelligent distances. Then I said, okay, let's look at also space time. I was thinking space time is going to be much more complicated, and uh, it wasn't really because you have distances in space and you have distances in time, and you have maybe also seasonality. When you do any space time, you have to take into account, for example, cosine. So, like a temperatures in the world, you know, there's a seasonality uh, uh, component. And so you can incorporate that. This is the distance in time, and this is the seasonality. And you can incorporate that, and then you do machine learning, and we compared daily rainfall predictions. These are the point data with the rainfalls, rainfall measurements. This is in uh, Colorado. Um, this is somewhere here. I think it's Boulder, Boulder, Colorado. So, so we incorporated that, and you see predictions made by the space-time Kriging below. And these are the predictions made by the random forest using both space and time as distances. And uh, very interestingly, it's a similar pattern. Here you have a bit more landscape is emphasized. You have, because uh, like random forest is a tree-based model. It's a, uh, basically a class decision tree. And irrigation uh, problems, it works as a regression tree. And so it's a tree, so it will split. So you can do the splits, and you can have this um, um, uh, kind of um, um, uh, drops in value, okay? So it can incorporate it nicely. But the Kriging cannot do that. Space and Kriging cannot do that. It, it needs covariates or something that to be very distinct. And so you can see this difference in the split. Um, so, so we looked at it, okay, what are the advantages of uh, doing a random forest uh, like this? Uh, so, well, one thing that pops up is uh, especially the you don't have this stationarity requirements. So you don't have to assume global uh, variogram, same parameters all around. You don't have to assume them. As long as you have enough data, the machine learning is going to find where you have an isotropy, where you don't have an isotropy, where you have a, a, a small spatial range of dependence, large spatial dependence. So you don't have these stationarity requirements. Obviously, there's no normal distribution requirements. Most of model-based statistics still it's uh, either a linear models or generalizing linear models. Um, and also, you don't have to fit the variogram. You don't have to fit it at all, actually. Um, and this is something a bit scary, maybe, uh, because you know you, you don't have to fit the variogram, but you get this spatial dependence. You have this structure, right? So how is that possible? Right? But I, what I try to explain you, it is basically by giving an enough data to machine learning, it tries to find this nonlinear dependence between distances and variation. So you do kind of fit a variogram inside the machine learning. Um, and, and also what's very uh, important is that uh, uh, when you do uh, machine learning, like when you do regression Kriging, you have to fit the regression, then you get the residuals, then you model the variogram for residuals, but you do these models independently, basically. Most of people still do it independently. There's a maybe ways to do that uh, jointly. So there may be ways uh, to go and do that uh, jointly, but they are cumbersome. You have to do iteration by iteration. When you do machine learning, you put all the data at, at once, you model relationship between distances and the feature space 
at the same time. And you can even sort it and see which one is more important. Is it some points are more important, some values? Or is it some uh, DM derivative or satellite image? So you can compare in live time. Um, so, so that was a, like a long introduction to that. Um, uh, and then further on, what, what you discover when you do machine learning, obviously, uh, as you have more and more covariates, as you have nonlinear problems, as you have complex relationships, this is where the machine learning really scores very well. And uh, uh, also, like shifting to from building, like when you do lots of, I think, studies in the world, they were focused on doing like things locally. You know, we have thousands of publications. Somebody does a map in Germany, somebody in Belgium, somebody in Denmark, somebody in Argentina. Everybody's like doing their own little projects, right? And so I feel like today, I think, you know, we should integrate forces, integrate computing capacity, integrate all the points, and put it all together and make the best maps of the world. You know, that's what I feel like is possible when you have, uh, like, if you, you have a very flexible machine learning and you, you saw the problems of spatial dependence and things, then, you know, why do little, why do many little projects? When you have like a tree-based system, that will incorporate these uh, bifurcations. It will be incorporated in the model, but you model it at once. And I don't know if you heard about it. We do have a project, it's called Open Land Map. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been combining all this point data of the world and making uh, maps, for example, of soil types. Um, and so, there are, so this is all this theory that I was showing you. So now you see it in, in practice. So let's go where we are now. Um, so you can see we, we predict the soil types um, based on the USDA soil taxonomy using 350,000 training points now. And I have about 300 covariates. The only when I overlay the points and the covariates, I get a regression matrix of two gigabytes, okay? And I will run a machine learning on this data, which will be done within one hour. I run it on a bit bigger system, uh, but, but in one hour it's done. And in, uh, in one day, the maps are, maps are also done. And you can see in the system, you can see the, the training points. Uh, so you can compare the, 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 po the training points and predictions. So let's say we zoom in here. And so we have, we have a training point and it says it's a, a Hugh Maclebs. And then if I click on the prediction, uh, Hap Ludos, it's a bit different. Let me click here. Hop Ludolf. It's a bit different. So there is a, there is definitely a bit different than what is uh, observed. Uh, but if I go, so let me go to some other point. Always when I have to validate my maps, always I get different. You know, by by chance I pick up a point, I get it differently. <laughs> now let's take a look at this point. These are some Eru trochops, and if I click next to it, uh, it's also different. So yeah, they, are, they get some classes get smoothed out. They get smoothed out. Maybe I have to look a bit more over the border in US because they have most of the points. Well, let's take a look at here somewhere. There's some classes get, uh, uh, when they're like a small classes, they don't have so many values, then they do get uh, smoothed out. Um, Udals, I click. Okay, here I get the same. So you see I have the point observation prediction. So you can go and validate. You can go and validate. Uh, so, so yeah, we have put that. And uh, you know, when I was doing machine learning, I did shoot myself in the foot. Uh, like I made about two or three bigger mistakes. Uh, I had to go to uh, people to apologize about that. Um, one of the mistakes I made, I was mapping soil organic carbon of the world, and uh, uh, in the previous system that I was developing the soil grid. And I produced values about two times higher in average. And I couldn't see it. I mean, I was looking just as cross validation, but I made somewhere, I was doing a merge between two models and in my programming, I think I made somewhere a mistake. And so, but then we reset that and we started with this open land map. So we map again the soil organic carbon. So if you, have you, be, have you used this soil organic carbon map maybe? Yes. So an open land map, right? Okay, so so this is a bit better now. The, the the values are okay, the absolute values, and also we put the stocks, 
but still for Canada they're a bit higher values and I, I'm not sure why I mean it's uh, it's training points are the problem absolutely uh, so we definitely need more training points uh, but for the for the rest of the world I think the values they do match quite okay but we miss lots of patches of organic carbon we miss here in in Africa also I, we know that there's a a peatland here in Congo, you know, but so we get a bit of this pattern of the peatland, but probably not enough. So we probably underestimate. But many people say, well, why don't you fix Congo? Just fix it. So I, yeah, I don't do fixes by hand. I mean, I don't fix maps by hand. I can. The only thing I can fix, I can fix code. That's the only thing I do. Um, and I don't do fixes by hand. But um, but otherwise, yeah, that was the soil carbon, and of course we got the the pH. Um, pH is quite good. I mean, these are the variables uh, the, uh, relatively easy to map. You see it's uh, in, uh, in uh, three dimensions. You can see how things change through depth. Um, and then the recent thing is what we've been doing is uh, uh, soil, uh, um, soil hydraulic properties we are mapping now. We map the available water capacity. We map the um, uh, wilting point and fuel capacity. And this is not through pedo transfer functions. This is directly from laboratory data. And so I'm very happy with that. So slowly, I think we're making improvements. And we had the last discussion. We would like to switch to 100 meter a global. And unfortunately, we don't have a budget for this now. Uh, but it will, it's doable. So we will start first preparing the layers at 100 meter. And then as soon as that is done, I think maybe even by the end of the year, we'll have the, uh, all the uh, soil and vegetation maps at 100 meter. And that, that should be different. The resolution, very important. You, I can see now that, uh, yes, if you don't move to finer resolution, that usability of map stays uh, very limited. So we do want to move to like 30 meter resolution as soon as possible, but at the moment, yes, we don't have a budget. Um, okay, so so if you haven't seen or oh, just open land map, it's like, I that was my dream a uh, long time ago. I wanted to make like a, I like open, Street map, I like, I'm a Wikipedia type of person. I think it's power, it's in the people and, and in a structured and constructive collaboration. And then uh, uh, I'm so happy now we have this system open land map and many people are using it. And also if you make global maps, we host them. So if you make a global map, you want to share, it's possible. We have other people's maps also. Uh, we put, uh, of course, link. Uh, but we uh, th really the only requirements it has to be open data, and it has to be uh, documented. So the best is if it's computationally documented, and at least it, there should be a peer review paper. So if you have these two things, we can host. If you do global data, we host it. It's no problem, and it's the cost is on us. Unless you want to host like 30 meter, 100 meter, then we have to see if we have to extend our capacity. Uh -huh. you DOI. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so every layer uh, is a good question. So uh, this is very transparent system, so you can see the code, how the maps are made. If you want to download the whole data, you can download a little chunk of data, but you can also download the whole world, and then you get the DOI. Yes, then you have a, you see it's a DOI. This is for soil type map, and every uh, new version. So this is a, still a first version, and we're going to make a second version as soon as we get a bit more points. Uh, and then we keep on making versions, but the unique, there's a unique DOI. Okay, so you see this is a unique DOI that will link to the most up-to-date version. So you as a user, you shouldn't be thinking about uh, the versions. You should just be thinking uh, what I'm using here, how is it being computed? And, you know, you want to have a fast and robust access. So we have a web coverage service, we have Zenodo, we have uh, all the layers and also on Google Earth Engine. So a copy of uh, open land map is on Google Earth Engine. So if you want to, if you prefer to use Google Earth Engine, go ahead and use it. Um, so that's the, that's the idea of open land map. As I said, I'm also happy that, you know, I was developing techniques for years, years. And now I said, okay, now let's make it serious. Let's put really the best data, uh, the best covariate layers, and let's just make it happen. And so I'm also happy that, you know, this is based on, all based on open source software. Uh, so I think it's 100% uh, made, made in open source software, it's open data, um, and we, you know, we do see that we do see that the traffic has been growing. So um, we are slowly approaching, I think, 30,000 people. Uh, so that's all very good. 
Um, okay, that's the thing I want to talk about. That um, there are many other papers where people use our machine learning for spatial, uh, uh, so spatial analysis or, or spatial data. I found this paper by colleagues from China, um, and I think I, I, I didn't understand exactly what they do, but I think they try to reconstruct uh, like a topography uh, by using a samples of points. And so you can see this is the the the, the truth. And this is what they get from the neural nets. And it's scary how close it matches, you know. So, so I think very soon there will be more and more applications of machine learning, not only for spatial interpolation, but also it, there will be many applications, you know, for process modeling, for uh, recognition of patterns in landscapes, for sp uh, recognition of space-time patterns. So I think there will be more and more applications. So you should definitely be prepared for that. Um, what are the problems of machine learning? It's not perfect, okay? It's not like uh, you just use it blindly. Uh, what I discovered, as I said, I shoot myself in a foot. I, I made some problems with, the coding gets longer, so I made some problems with coding. I get this estimate of carbon too high. Uh, I also did a mistake with the cross-validation. So I admitted uh, four or five years ago, I will run cross-validation, and I will ignore location of points. And uh, because I work with the three-dimensional data, so you have like a, a point and has multiple horizons, like soil profile. So I will take randomly subset the horizons and then do cross-validation. And I got very nice result cross-validation, R squared 0 0.85. And then thanks to mainly to Travis Nauman from USGS, he told me, ah, oh, you know, you should do the whole station. So you take the whole station out. And we had some discussion. I said, okay, let's do it like that. Poof, suddenly cross-validation dropped 30%. So it's not 0 0.85, now it's 0 0.65. And I said, okay. And I started to understand why this happened. And because the, of the combination of feature space, when you have only covariates uh, two-dimensional and you have the third dimension, then all the covariates are the same for the point. And then the algorithm recognizes the same, exactly the same pattern. It has no problem predicting other values. And so that, that was one of the things that I made a mistake. And, and the other thing I made a mistake, I, I ignored the uh, sensitivity of machine learning to extrapolation. So when you look in, uh, uh, when you do like a linear, uh, mo a linear model, by the way, this thing, there's a code. Yeah? Usually you, when you see my slides, there's always code behind. So the only thing you have to remember is this URL. So some nice uh, person, Peter Ellis, uh, he made this code where he shows uh, this is a training data set. The red thing is the random forest uh, predictions. The red thing is the predictions by linear regression. And these are the predictions by random forest. Visualize that this is extrapolation of random forest. And so what happens here is that, is it some would, should random forest do that or not? We shouldn't be doing that. But if you understand random forest, it's a decision tree. And it, it can only work uh, in the space where it has data. If it goes to a new, it's like uh, any uh, uh, artificial intelligence system. If you ask this question that it was never trained to answer, it gives a silly answer or no answer. Okay? Or, or it can just find something which is on the edge of that space and just say, okay, the last thing I remember is that these values are like this. So if you move further, then the values are still like that. So it is, I mean, it is the nature of random forest. It's like it can only work where it has data. As you move out, you will get something like this. Now, some people will say, well, that's an artifact. If you map it in space, if you make a map of a model like this, what do you get? You get like a blunder. You get some artifacts, and you can see it, right? And I bet you that's because of this. It doesn't have a training data to learn. And uh, some people say, well, you know, but this model assumes that it's all linear, you know, but it could be really, it could be really that from this point, it's not linear, right? It could be also, well, we, we kind of look at it, but that's a very low chance. I mean, because all the points are kind of on the line. I mean, there's a very low chance if you go beyond this, that suddenly it goes some direction. So, so in this case, everybody, I mean, if I will send these two plots, around uh, you and I say which which model do you bet on everybody will bet on this model right because 
because you see the most of points are kind of flatted on the line. We say, well, this is probably with high confidence, this is the linear model. And this is one of the problems of using, uh, for example, random forest. And this thing I ignored. I ignored that extrapolation problem, and I produced artifacts. I made the maps with artifacts. I had a, a, a when we did the, so I can show you that here. Um, when we did, for example, soil class mapping for Sahara, we will get some soil types which are completely out. I mean, it's, they're impossible to be in Sahara. And also for soil organic carbon, we will get a soil organic carbon 2% in Sahara. And I was thinking, why? Uh, but because we had no points in Sahara. And the model didn't know in dryland that, you know, it's, it's a sandy content, it's, you know, no carbon, zero carbon. The model doesn't know. And when you think about it, soil scientists, there, nobody's going to go do soil profile description in Sahara. I mean, you will go like, are you crazy? There are some people in U.S. that went to these deserts and they did actually lab analysis. I mean, they will say 98% sand, you know, like zero carbon or something. So they did in U.S., but in the rest of the world, nobody goes like the extreme areas and you don't do any, you know, soil sampling. But the model doesn't know. So what we did, we simulate this, these are pseudo points. We simulate them and we know which are the soil types which are like shifting sand. We know which is the soil type. And then when we rebuild the models with this, we fill in all these extrapolation gaps, then it gets better and better. And so that was the things that I, uh, one of the things I ignored. Um, then also, I also ignored it that machine learning is really statistics combined with computer science. And every time you fit a model, so let's say, uh, so we are here. So I fitted this model M. It's a, actually, it's a large object. Um, if I look at the size, you see it's, it's eight megabytes. So the data set is like half megabyte. The model is eight megabytes. Okay. The model is bigger than the data. That's why I have to warn you that about machine learning because it's hyperparametric. Well, I also in this M object, I save also the grids and the points. So, so you have to take like one megabyte out, but still it's about, you know, 10 times bigger. And so in this model, if you look at the structure, now I have to be very careful because this is a huge model. So I have to look at the structure, but I have to say I want to look at um, some a maximum level of one, let's say. Um, so it says like this, then I do two. Okay. So you see there's the, the uh, machine learning model. There's the variable model, there's the covariates, and there's this uh, ID, ID from the blocks. So this, this is what they now make in the, uh, what they call a SP learner. So that's a model which is learner for spatial data. So it has the, the model, which is ensemble machine learning models. It has the variogram, which are fit with GOR. It has all the covariates, so you can reconstruct to do prediction. And it has the uh, ID of the blocks, which are estimated based on those uh, fitted variogram. Uh, so if I look further in this SP model, um, so let's take a look at this. So now you see I'm, I'm now zooming in into the, the, the machine learning model, okay? And it has different things here. It has the family, it has also uh, the uh, sub-predict, uh, and it has these sub-fits. Now each of the sub-fits, if I zoom even further, you see each of the sub-fits sub is saved as a different object. So the XG boost, which is called here J1, it's a, a, a cross-validation subset J1. Um, so it fits a XG boost model. So I can look at that further. It's, ki it's kind of like a hierarchical structure. But what I'm really trying to show you is that as I go further, I can, go, I can come and see the actual model parameters. So if I go here, I have the object, um, and then let's see object and and here I will have the model somewhere so under the forest you see so like uh, second level third level fourth level fifth level sixth level and then I have the parameters and these parameters long if I print them I mean it will it will blow up because maybe 10,000 parameters so you can see all the parameters 
And so many people uh, before they would ask me, you know, the machine is like a black box system. And I also ignored, I didn't look at the parameters. Then later on, I started to say, well, okay, uh, we have to be more intelligent. Every time you fit a model, you want to do kind of post-modeling diagnostics. Remember that. And this is many of the machine learning today. It focuses on the post-modeling diagnostics. When I go to a user conference, many new packages, how do you do that post-modeling diagnostics? And there's an excellent book. It's called Interpretable Machine Learning. Highly recommended. This, is, this should be your priority. And it explains some, uh, it has about uh, 10 to 15 approaches to do a post model diagnostics. Number one approach, which sticks out for the regression type of problems especially, is called partial correlation plots. You may be, maybe some of you have run it. So here you see there's a machine learning model I fitted to do a pedo transfer. This model is explained in the book, so you can find it in the book. But I will just now show you what is this post-modeling diagnostics. You have, I, I try to predict bulk density as a function of gravel content, clay content, sand content, carbon, and depth. Okay, bulk density. I want to make a pedal transfer because bulk density is usually missing. I have like 10% of uh, points have bulk density. So this is all Australian data. And let's do the uh, pedal transfer for, to estimate bulk density. And this thing, which you see, the, the broken line, is the random forest. And then this thing you see around it is the uncertainty of that. And now, what is a post-model diagnostic? So most important thing is here at carbon. So what happens, the uh, machine learning picks up general relationship. As you have more carbon, the soil uh, bulk density drops. But what happened here, it starts going up. Do you see this? So it starts going up. And this is my knowledge now of soil science. They say, no, this is nonsensical. There's a, there's a problem here with machine learning. And I know this problem is here. It happens around 10, 12% carbon. When the carbon goes beyond 12%, this pedal transfer function will be suboptimal. And so I have the top of the top of the top machine learning, but I will produce a nonsense if somebody says, I want to use your model to estimate bulk density, but my carbon is 15%. I will make, I will, you know, produce something which is uh, worse than I will expect with a simple model. I could just use a simple model to get a better result. And this is, this is what I want to emphasize in this course. You want to do machine learning. Don't think it's just a, you know, a one thing you click. You know, you do maybe less time on modeling and thinking about models. But you have to invest your energy in, in post-model diagnostics. And, and this book, as I said, is the excellent guide. Of course, our book down book. Um, and it's an excellent guide to how you do it properly. It's also open book. Um, uh, so that's the, the other thing is the ensemble. Uh, and then I will stop. So ensemble is, you know, you have this. Uh, this is not my plot. I took it uh, from this lady. Uh, she was teaching this course, um, I think it was a new czar, and I think she just figured out, okay, for me, the easiest thing, the way to teach is I just make a quickly R book down. So she made this, like, just for the conference, she made almost like a, a 100 pages book or something, right? And then she goes and ex explains all these ensemble techniques. Uh, ensemble techniques. So you see, I, I, uh, I, I took that from her, this thing. I took from her, it's not my figure. Um, and then she explained you how to do, what are the approaches to do ensemble. She doesn't cover all the approaches, but main approach, she mentions three approaches, begging, boosting, stacking, but there are also other, other approaches, uh, but that's kind of the idea. Um, ensemble, there's a complexity of ensemble, um, like, uh, you know, how do you do that merge? What's the best way? And there is a complexity there. It's not like the most easiest way to look at it is just a average. You have five models in your average. But you think of, when you think about it, it's not efficient because of five models, maybe two models are very poor. And if you just average, if you anywhere you add noise, the add no, noise will propagate. And so you can hurt the model. So you need an intelligent way you merge. And that's what these people develop. They develop these more intelligent ensemble ways. Then they become computational. So they said, okay, we should do more checking. So then the methods become computational. 
and then they go beyond that and they say, okay, now we do something intelligent and computationally efficient. And these are the methods that you know people then recommend through packages. They say, look, this is intelligent way and it's computationally efficient. Um, as far as I know, there are probably other ways to do ensemble, but definitely the H2O has built-in ensemble, so you don't have to go and figure it out. There's the current ensemble, uh, which I don't use, so I, I, I tried it a bit and I didn't see that it has the things I want. There's the MLR, and there's the super learner sub, sub sample packages, which are connected. These just extend this one. It's just a wrapper on top of this. Um, and so which one do you use? Well, um, I looked at the super learner. I liked it. It has all the things I needed. Uh, it has also a very nice way you can do diagnostics of ensemble, so you can see which model is the uh, most significant. Uh, it has a penalization, which is, I think, um, efficient. You know, let's say if you have 50 models, you know, many times you have 50 models, and the panelization, the super learner will panelize most of them, so he will pick up only three or four. Because if you have something which helps you just a bit, like 1%, it's not worth it. Right? So penalization is very high. Do you understand that? If you have some model that helps you improve variance 20%, uh, accuracy, sorry, 20%, then it's worth the effort to use. But something that, uh, you know, just helps you a bit, it's not worth using it. And a super learner gives you the zero weight. So it's a very efficient in that way. Um, by the way, this is the ensemble, right? That's the main logic of ensemble. You have multiple models and you have like a mean model that represent all these models in an intelligent way. Uh, most of cases when you do ensemble, so super learner, you can see the RMSC, it's the best. It doesn't happen always. Sometimes the ensemble is as good as some single model. But if it's worse than a single model, then you're doing something wrong. Because it, you know, then it's a, something is like you're using some ensemble which is just like a average and then you you introduce some noise but otherwise it it shouldn't happen do you understand that so if you do ensemble it it can it, it should be as good as the best model but it shouldn't be worse by accident it can be a bit worse but shouldn't be statistically significantly worse so it's like really it's you know if you repeat it many times no it just you know statistically out and then you're doing something wrong. But in most of cases, ensemble will increase your accuracy, but also it can only increase for little. If it increases for a, a lot, then also something strange. And do you understand that with ensemble? Do you know why? Why, why ensemble can only increase accuracy a bit? Do you, do you understand that? Herod? Actually, make it worse, even I think sometimes. If, but if you use an intelligent way to check ensemble to do the merging, the weights, is there a chance then that you could make worse? No, I guess so. if, if you have like one by accident, you one could get very good, another very bad, quite bad. You take a weighted average. Well, maybe it's better just to rely on the single method only. Yes, but but if you do an estimate for the ensemble coefficient using cross checking then the bad method should have a weight zero. And then you, it, it. Maybe it will do 0.05. Yes. yes, yes, I yes, know. yes. And you could have by accident because you do draws, you know, like in machine learning, you do lots of trial and error, lots of draws. And if you don't do enough draws, or if you by accident, you pick up a draws that have a kind of accidentally position that train the model in a way, then you could get a bit worse. But normally you shouldn't get worse and you cannot get much better. If you get much better, it's something strange. And you cannot get much better because then it means you're doing, you have some magic, right? And because this is just ensemble, it's just a combination of the best covariates. So it just, it will just move it a bit further, you know, like a 10, 20%. But if you have a double accuracy with ensemble, that will be for me very strange. I would say, well, you have to check that. Don't use it like that. It could be something went wrong. Uh, okay, this is now, I showed you the paper was on the random forest, just random forest. 
now we have a package land map and this is the result uh, of uh, using the uh, ensemble machine learning and I will show you now the differences look at the differences uh, this is both I think this is a, a zinc content this is the GOR this is the ensemble machine learning the GOR picks up these two three points this point here this point here this point here they have high values they have high values and it kind of picks it up and it goes to the point it's also any Kriging is a convex interpolator so it comes exactly to the point at the point um, so so you see these three points but they're not visible in in ensemble machine learning this point the values are lower do you see this so in machine learning it has to subset and it do, does it many times so so here behind this uh, map there's 15 models actually 15 models and it, and they're based on subsetting they don't use the whole data and if the subsetting shows that it's a single point that doesn't matches the spatial continuity and doesn't match any covariate then it says yeah this is smooth it out if there are more points so you see here there are more points which have a higher value then this pattern remains but I notice for machine learning a spatial data ensemble machine learning if you have an isolated point and it cannot be explained with the covariate it's going to get smoothed out most likely yes could be that I don't have the right covariate yes I'm not saying that I have the perfect model I'm just saying that given these covariates and given that I do uh, machine learning with subsetting and testing is a very high chance that isolated points will get smoothed out and I understand it why um, uh, by the way this is the code this was a sub sample uh, model with the uh, four uh, four machine learning models GLM net Ranger uh, random forest uh, kernel support vector machines and XGBoost all very efficient so they're ready for big data um, Sorry? The parameters of the model that you want to ensemble, do you tune those? I don't tune them, but you can. You can if you want. You can you can add more code and you say I want to also tune before ensemble. It's possible. It's uh, it's no problem. So I don't do it now because maybe I'm also a bit lazy. But uh, yes, tuning is a good idea. But you, I, you, I will have to make more code and it's then more computational. Yeah, my, my problem is, as you see, like I made this and I like the framework and it's now compact. You know, it's a one line. You fit ensemble machine learning for spatial data with variogram cross validation, spatial cross validation with uh, this uh, very intelligent ensemble. So it's all there. But, you know, I compute like 40 seconds just for the mass data set. Imagine if I put something a few million pixels, then I have to move to some more serious computing infrastructure. Uh, these are the individual models and I do this um, uh, this is a, a so-called stacking method it's a stacking method where you uh, compute a GLM model uh, using a cross validation uh, so three fold cross validation it computes a GLM model and computes basically a linear combination of the predictors and you can see just coefficient it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive if the coefficient is a large number it means that this pre, uh, this model uh, is important so I put in bold the ones that stick out so this is random forest GLM net GLM net so these are the ones that stick out okay and then you do the next thing there's this uh, spatial cross validation for the mass data set I will get spatial dependence based on variogram so it's about I think 300 meters and then you make these blocks and then you can also see and this is very nice now remember this point I showed you high values so this point will also show a high highest variance so there's a highest difference between models just for that single point yes it's and it's very different from the rest of the area just this point here kind of sticks out it doesn't relate to any covariate it, it, it's all the points around it are small values you know so it really sticks out but unlike with the Kriging error, your Kriging error is like a, a stationary model, so it's 
the variance is always the, more or less the same. It depends only on the distance from points. You cannot pick up a single point or, or two points which are, are very different. Uh, and this is uh, finally to show you just, this is animation. These are these models. They're quite different, actually. They're all displayed on the same scale. And so these are all these models that you see in the uh, together, right? And they're quite different. And it's because of this subsetting. If you have a small data set, the subsetting effect has a large, uh, large impact. So by accident, you could subset a couple of high points. And then the, this pattern disappears. And then you see this is the, the uh, ensemble prediction, and this is the model error. This is not the prediction error. I still don't know how to derive. That's something for discussion if somebody is interested. We are just writing a paper on all this. And, but I still don't know how to do the prediction error and, and uh, uh, prediction intervals, uh, like 90% probability, using ensemble spatial machine learning. I don't know how to do it exactly. I think it's somewhere around here, but I have to check. Uh, okay, I stop now and uh, let's have a coffee break. I went